Welcome, benvenuti a tutti. It's lovely to see you all here today. I'm Nina Hall. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Assistant Professor of International Relations here at SAIS Europe. Welcome also to those of us, uh, to those of you who are joining online. Um, today, it's unusual because normally I'm introducing guests, which I will do in a minute, but I'm also here to discuss my book, which has uh, recently come out, Transnational Advocacy in the Digital Era. Um, and I, so I will be discussing some of the key findings of the book. But for me, the most exciting part of the evening is actually to hear the responses um, of, of two guests who are going to give us, I think, very different takes on what the book means for them and the work, research and worlds that they live and move in. So I want to introduce the two of them. Um, first, uh, Mark, Mark Hannes. He's a serial social entrepreneur, co-founder of two startups, Inclusive America, a non-profit to increase diversity in government. And I should say, I know that um, it was very successful during the Biden administration in terms of trying to push Biden um, to accept uh, greater diversity in, in, in senior and all levels of appointments. Um, also Progressive Shopper, another a tech company to harness conscious consumption. Hannes is also associate fellow here at the European campus of Johns Hopkins at SAIS. So many of the students tomorrow, you'll have a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one and hear more about social entrepreneurship. Um, he's a senior fellow, Lang fellow at Swarthmore College, and he has also founded several other social impact organizations in the past, including the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, um, the Organ Alliance to address the unnecessary deaths due to a shortage of transplantable organs, and United to End Genocide to empower citizens and communities with the tools to prevent and stop genocide. Marx also served as a White House fellow, worked in the office of the Vice President of Joe Biden at the, as the National Security Affairs Special Advisor for South America, Africa, and Human Rights, and he's had various fellowships for social entrepreneurship, including Ashoka, Echoing Green, uh, Draper, Richards, Capelin, and Hunt Alternative Prime Movers, and was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. And it's really exciting because the first time we actually met was in Australia in a tiny uh, spot called Kangaroo Valley when I was just starting this research and I was scratching my head and going, what are all these activists doing? Meeting on the outskirts of, well, it wasn't really the outback because it was outside of uh, Sydney. Um, and Mark and I had a very brief conversation at that point in time. And it was years later when um, Mark moved from the US to Cagliari to Sardinia and reached out to me that we reconnected and refound um, our common sort of research and interest. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear your reflections on the book, given you have some direct experience and expertise working with, with the open network, which I'll explain to the rest of you about shortly. Um, we also have Alice, Alice Matoni, who's an associate professor in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of Bologna, just next door. Um, she, her research focuses on the intersections between media, digital and otherwise, and social movements, civil society organizations and other movement organizations. So from an academic perspective, I can't think of somebody better to really think about how digital technologies is, is, is shaping social movement organizations and, and, and sort of reflect on, on the book's contribution in that space. Since 2019, as principal investigator of the ERC-funded project BIT Act, um, Alicia has investigated how movement organizations develop and employ digital media platforms to counter corruption across the world. And if you're interested to uh, find out a little bit more about that project, check out their website. Um, and since 2002, she's also been cooperating partner for the Auto Wealth, Automating Welfare Project, um, which looks at algorithmic infrastructures for human flourishing in Europe. And uh, she's also got various uh, other editorial roles. She's the coordinating editor of Social Movement Studies, which is an open um, and also of the open access journal Participazione e Conflitto and on the editorial board of, of social media. So the, tonight's lineup is I get to chat to you and tell you a little bit more about the book. Um, I'll speak for 20, 25 minutes, and if I get too long, one of these two can tell me to be quiet, because I really want this to be a, an evening for discussion and debate and to hear from Mark, from Alicia, and then from you all. So they'll speak after me for about um, eight minutes or so, and then we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. 
For those of you who are listening online, um, we are interested to hear your questions. So please do put them that in the Q&A rather than in the chat and we will do our best to engage with them. And those of you who are here in person, the bonus tonight is that there's a short aperitivo afterwards. So please stick around and after the talk, come downstairs and um, yeah, an aperitivo to, to celebrate the, the launch of the book. All right, so the book, the book, um, which you can see behind, um, came out in June this year. And even though it's about transnational advocacy in the digital era, I want to make a really key point starting off. I'm not just talking about politics and advocacy that happens online. The book looks at a group of organizations of what I call digital advocacy organizations who mobilize people both online and offline and use digital technologies to do that. And I argue in the book that they have been influential in a number of cases on issues such as trade campaigning. And this is to give you a couple of examples of, of the ways that they've shaped public debate. So in Germany in 2015, Campact, a German digital advocacy organization, was part of a broad coalition that mobilized a quarter of a million people on the streets outside uh, the Brandenburg gates. You can see this big crowd. And at the bottom of that image is the Brandenburg gate. And the bit at the top is going towards the Tiergarten. Uh, on the right is the image of uh, Christoph Bautz, who's one of the founders of Campact. He was speaking at this event. Um, and the reason I put his image up there is to emphasize that the organizations that are, are based on, they have people who are sitting in offices and headquarters and going out and working with people, mobilizing them on the streets. In this case, it was against the tra tra uh, sorry, Transatlantic Trade and Intellectual Property Agreement, um, where a lot of Germans were exceptionally concerned by uh, the fact that the EU was going to sign a trade agreement with the US. We can get into the nitty gritty of what sort of things they were concerned by, but it include things like chlorinated chickens that might have to flood the European markets right through to investor state court um, dispute settlements. And so as a result, Campact worked with a number of other civil society NGOs to mobilize people to say, we don't want Germany to sign this trade agreement. In New Zealand, across the ocean, there were similar protests on the U.S. Uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, which included a number of Pacific uh, countries, including New Zealand. And Action Station, the sister organization of Campact, it's another digital advocacy organization, helped mobilize people on the streets there. And then in Poland, on a very different issue, Aksha Demokratia, which is the name you can't quite see at the bottom of the billboard there, um, tried to mobilize, also mobilize people on the streets against um, Poland, the Polish government's decision to try and lower the retirement age for judges. And this was seen importantly as a sort of backsliding in democracy because the executive was interfering in, in the independence of the judiciary. So the point of this slide is to say two things. One, the organizations I study are digital, and we'll hear more about what that means, but they're using digital technologies to mobilize people online and offline and doing so across a number of issues and in a number of countries. Now, what I became interested in is that digital advocacy organizations, the groups that I study, are a real global phenomenon. They exist in over six continents and 19 over 19 countries actually now, um, many of which are in Europe from Hungary, Poland. Uh, there's also organizations in Israel, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. There have been attempts and organizations in, in Latin America. There's a new group that's just um, been set up in the last few years in, in Brazil, which isn't on this map, Canada and the US. And these organizations claim over 20 million supporters. And I will give you a little bit more um, on, on those supporters. Now, these organizations aren't necessarily household names. Uh, some of you, how many of you know Move On, just out of curiosity? Yeah, a few hands going up. Anyone know Get Up? I don't expect you to. Because what I found when I started this research is I actually didn't know any of these organizations when I started out six years ago. And that's partly because these organizations focus on mobilizing people within their own countries to push for progressive changes across a wide range of issues. Now, I'm going to introduce MoveOn uh, briefly because MoveOn was the first digital advocacy organization 
It was launched in 1998 and the rest followed after that in the 2000s and mid 2000s. And what's different about Move On and what got me curious about all of these organizations is that rather than following the same model of what NGOs like Greenpeace or Oxfam do, Move On and Get Up and all of these other digital advocacy organizations get their power from creating a big email list. It sounds a bit weird, right? What, how do you go from getting people to sign up to an online petition and leaving your email to doing what we saw on that first slide, getting lots of people out in the streets? Now, the argument is this, that Move On collects people's petition, uh, emails through petitions and tries to mobilize them online through other petitions or sharing things on social media, but also to take actions offline. And what's interesting is that they're not just doing so on one issue. They're not move on or campaign, for instance, isn't just mobilizing people on trade. It's collecting those email addresses to then use for subsequent campaigns on other issues. And this was where in the late 90s and early 2000s, Move On really pioneered this. It started out working on various progressive issues. And then during the Iraq war, when there was a, a, a large uh, backlash against the Bush administration's decision to go to war in Iraq, Move On was able to use its large email list to contact people around the, uh, around the US, also actually had some global members, um, and, and mobilize them. Now, what's important here is that they weren't just using the email addresses, of course. They were also doing something which Dave Karp talks about, which is called analytic activism. So most of us are familiar with Amazon, we're familiar with Netflix, and we know that, you know, when we go online to watch a movie, we're not sure what we want to watch. Netflix tells us or gives us suggestions of things you might like based on previous things we've watched. There's a similar logic in a way operating in these campaigning groups. So once you've signed up to one petition, these groups continue to send you other campaigns that might be of interest to you. And what's important here is that they're monitoring and listening to whether or not you open the emails, you click through and take the actions recommended, um, and then maybe donate. And so they're able to survey and listen by uh, that analytic activism. To give you a concrete example of this, these groups know which color button is most effective to get people to donate, donate the most. So if you say donate now, orange is more effective than blue. And you can do that by sending half of this group sitting here orange and half blue. And if you imagine you've got a million people on your list, that's statistically significant, right? As we know, if it's a small group like this, maybe it actually doesn't make that much difference. Now, what I'm describing so far has been actually described in the political communications literature. I'm not really adding anything particularly new. Dave Karp, in fact, has written this great book called The Move On Effect, which talks about how Move On, using these kinds of things, collecting emails, using analytic activism, pioneered a whole lot of a new generation of, of advocacy. And he makes the argument this had a profound impact on other American political advocacy organizations. But what hasn't happened and what my book seeks to do is to connect the dots because Move On's in the US, Get Up's in Australia, 38 Degrees in the UK, Campact in Germany, Amandla Mobi in South Africa, Quifta in Sweden. These organizations are all united around an exactly the same model. And the book traces how this model has spread and how these organizations collaborate. And it makes, it, it, it makes the argument that these organizations aren't just having an impact domestically, they're also having some transnational impact. And that's important because the political communication scholarship, not just CARP, but other great work like on Get Up in Australia has focused on their impact in their national context. And that's why when I present generally to scholars of international relations, they all scratch their head and go, how come I've never heard of these organizations? Who are these? How do they operate? How do they get money? And this is a big part of what the book sets out to do, is to tell scholars working in international relations that we need to understand different modes of advocacy in the digital era. And many scholars have argued we need to have this. They've said we should have greater scholarship on, in, uh, on advocacy in the internet era, but they haven't taken up this challenge. And in fact, I argue in the book that we tend to rely on slightly outdated theories, which refer to the importance of facts uh, radio and email, which were once very important technologies in the 19, late 90s, but aren't so much today. 
So the questions underpinning the book are, to what extent or do digital advocacy organizations like Move On, like Campact, challenge theories that we have in international relations of how advocacy works? And how do these groups campaign transnationally? So more of an empirical question. And the second question is important to ask because there's a big literature in the late 90s and early 2000s about how we were going to see a global civil society emerge, partly because of the internet, right? It's going to be easier to communicate across borders. Anyone, anywhere can share, you know, an idea, a meme, a message, and that would help promote a global civil society. There was also a broader context, which I'm sure Alicia can mention, sort of like thinking and cosmopolitanism in the late 90s, early 2000s, the European Social Forum, the World Social Forum, these ideas were in the air. And I should point out an important thing, all the groups I study are progressive, and there's often a link and an assumption that the internet would help progressive actors build that progressive civil society. And we can maybe tease out to what extent it did that um, later in the Q&A. So how did I go about studying this? Um, and for students in the audience, I think there's lots of questions to ask about methods and how do you actually answer these questions and, and, and write the book that I have. I spent um, over five years interviewing and meeting with activists who are part of this network called OPEN, the Online Progressive Engagement Network, which is global and includes the organizations I've previously mentioned. Um, I observed them when they met face to face at summit. So like the first summit where I met Mark was a summit of a good, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 activists meeting in Australia from all around the world, spending a week sharing ideas about campaigning and how to use digital technology. And I've conducted over 100 interviews, many of them multiple interviews with, with founders of the organizations and collected a data set of their campaign actions. Um, I'm actually, if you're interested, you can see I'm in the photo somewhere at the back. I can't even see myself now. And there's actually another researcher, David Karp, who I mentioned earlier, is also there. David. Looks just like Ben. Yeah, yeah, he looks like Ben, and that's myself. Yeah. And Ben is the founder of the network who comes up as a, um, a, a really key active um promulgator of the model. He goes around the world from Israel to Ireland, spreading this model and a real champion. So the argument in the book is twofold. Firstly, in answering that first question, do digital advocacy organizations challenge IR theories? And I say, yes, they do. They do because they have a different source of power from what most NGOs. And that's that their power is from mobilizing people online and offline, like those trade protests you saw at the beginning. Um, whereas most NGOs tend to use expertise as a, as a part of, of their campaign model. Secondly, the groups formed a transnational network where interestingly, they collaborate a lot and share technology, they share tactics and they campaign on similar issues at the same time, but they all target the nation state. So there's a sort of nuance to the literature in global civil society, which says, oh, we're going to suddenly see everything become globalized, protests become globalized, the focus of our targets of our protest will become the WTO or the WHO or the UNFCCC that just met last week. Instead, I'm arguing uh, the nation state remains very important. So I'm going to present both of these arguments um, and then hand over to our speakers. So the first part of the book basically sets out what are, who are these organizations? How do they operate? What makes them different? And I call it also the four challenges to IR theories of advocacy. So first off, um, these groups campaign during elections. This is a very different model from if we think of NGOs like Greenpeace or Oxfam, which if they campaign during elections, they do so around an issue. They're not campaigning to get a particular politician out of office or into office. And Oxfam and Greenpeace, traditional NGOs can't because they have a charity model. They are mostly uh, set up as not-for-profits and their legal status means that they can't engage or use uh, in, in, in election campaigning. Instead, the groups that I study do this proactively. So they go out and they push for progressive candidates in office and they try to oust conservative ones get up who you can see the volunteers in orange um will door knock so conventional ta uh, tactics will canvas 
phone call. They'll often use digital tech to identify which streets are the most effective to door knock on. They'll fundraise. Um, they'll put up big billboards. This was for Tony Abbott, the former Prime Minister of, of, of Australia, who um, was not at all uh, active on climate change and get up, use this as a way to try and mobilize people again. So it actually got Get up was part of the reason Tony Abbott lost his seat in Warringah in central Sydney. So the point I make is that these groups, they're not just, you know, putting out the odd message in the news, they're actively engaging in campaigns and raising millions of dollars, getting attacked often by conservative forces, um, precisely because of their involvement in election campaigning. And that's an important part of their model because they're holding governments to account and politicians when it hurts them most during the election cycle. Right. And so then after the elections, when they're trying to campaign on issues based, they have power in a way over those politicians if, if they're effective, right, at, at mobilizing people. These other three elements uh, very much fit together. And you'll notice that I don't use the word digital anywhere on the slide. That's because digital technologies underpin and enable them to do these things, to be rapid response, right? The groups that I study, say Aufstein in Austria, I describe, I walk into their office one morning. Aufstein's in central Vienna. The activists are sitting there. They hadn't been talking about anything to do with Syria the day before when I left the office and I come in and they're suddenly writing a petition and within hours, they've sent out a petition in solidarity with Syria and Aleppo, which at that time was being bombed. Now, the point here is that they can rapidly do that because of that digital technology. They don't need to sit down and then, you know, send out a letter to all of their members and say, will you, you know, sign this petition or give us some money for this campaign? They can rapidly do that. But just as they can rapidly start a, a new campaign, they can rapidly drop a campaign. And this is what I found really interesting in the model is that they're multi-issue. And they are multi-issue because they're listening to their members. So all of the groups in, in, in the study aren't just focused on refugees or trade or climate or social socioeconomic issues. They're campaigning across all of them simultaneously, but depending on what members of their organization think is most important. So remember back to that example of the Netflix example. What does most of you think at one point in time? I can determine that by sending out different campaigns during a week and see which one performs best. Now, this is very different from how we think about NGOs like Oxfam, for instance. In international relations scholarship, you know, Oxfam performs a really important role on addressing poverty and inequality. And it will set out its campaign priorities the whole year. It knows that there's going to be the World Economic Forum in Davos and that they need to prepare a report on inequality um, for that. And then they'll have something on poverty and, you know, climate justice for the UNFCCC. So they staff drive those campaigns, they're not surveying constantly to figure out, well, should we focus on poverty this year or should we actually just focus on something completely else? Same with Human Rights Watch. It would be weird, right? If Human Rights Watch said to you, all right, class, what do you think is most important? You know, what's happening in Ukraine and human rights abuse there? What's happening in Ethiopia or what's happening in Burma? And we'll just do whatever you think. There would be a problem if campaigning was based on that model. So I'm describing an analytical way of understanding campaigning that's very distinct and it's based on being member-driven multi-issue rapid response and I argue that this model has power in some contexts because you can quickly jump to and mobilize mass support at moments when there's there's heightened political attention so one example in the book I give is in 2015 during the refugee crisis 38 degrees in the UK sets up this petition focuses it actually in this case on local councils and Norwich and around the UK and thousands sign it. They send all these emails to MPs and eventually backed by a much broader community, the prime minister at the time, David Cameron, agrees to welcome 20,000 Syrian refugees, an additional uh, refugee quota. And I should note here, it wasn't just 38 degrees campaigning, right? There was, a, there was a global context. There was a bunch of other organizations, but 38 degrees could shift really quickly. And other organizations around the world did this in my study. In Poland and New Zealand and Australia and Canada, they did similar things of mobilizing people on the streets and in tweets. So this is their strength. But this is the weakness, right? If you're really quick, you start your petition and then your members lose interest. And it turns out that your members, and this is 
a case in the UK are actually more interested in saving the bees. And, you know, there's good reason for saving bees. Um, you switch campaigns. So you campaign to save Syrians for a couple of weeks, but you never do the follow through. You never actually go, do those Syrians arrive? Do we ensure that the ongoing issues at Calais with refugees trying to cross the border uh, and get into the UK, are they, are they being helped? That drops because you're constantly reacting to members' revealed preferences. So part of the study in the book shows some of these shortcomings of the model. And I argue that for minority rights issues, this, this pure form of the model uh, is somewhat limited. And in fact, I even show that the model has evolved over time because the organizations have understood that if they are so purely reactive to members' revealed preferences, they won't be able to campaign effectively on refugee rights. And so we have at the top the sort of member-driven rapid reactive, right? This is what a lot of us associate with digital communications, where it's hard to run campaigns for minority rights. And then we have a staff-driven logic that I observe in some of the organizations, such as GetUp in Australia or Action Station in New Zealand, that, um, that, that evolves. And so to give you a counterexample to the British 38 degrees one, in Australia, the uh, get up, mobilized people in 2015 at the height of the crisis, got them out onto the streets with light the dark. But in February 2016, actually the time that Mark and I were in um, were in Australia, just after that, get up launched this other big campaign to try and get a whole lot of asylum seekers who were on Australian mainland not to be sent off to detention. And so they continued and they had a long term strategic vision to get all refugees and asylum seekers out of detention centers. So the book, essentially the first half makes this argument. We have a model, it's rapid, it's responsive, it's reactive, there's positives and weaknesses of it, but it's distinct from the ways other advocacy organizations operate. And now I wanna spend the last couple of minutes just giving you a bit of a sense of how these groups operate transnationally. Because as an IR scholar, what's fascinating is not only these groups exist in all these different countries, but they're coming together regularly in person to share their tactics, to share their tech messaging and strategies. And this is what you saw earlier, this, this, this summit um, of the OPEN, the Online Progressive Engagement Network. So it's a formalized network, which includes organizations, Camp Act, 38 Degrees, Move On, Amandla Mobi from around the world. And they're all nationally based organizations. And I should you should note that they share the same model of advocacy, what I just described, and also progressive values. And in the book, to try and untangle, well, how do these groups campaign transnationally? I ask the questions, well, how often do they campaign on transnational issues? How much of it is purely domestic? Because there are occasions where, you know, they're campaigning to save a local library or save a local park. And how often do they target international institutions? And this is because I want to untangle sometimes in the literature, we just talk about transnational advocacy, but there's different elements that can be transnational and they may not all be at the same time. So what I find, I collected um, campaign actions actually with a research, a SICE research assistant, um, Rebecca Johns. We collected 150 actions across four organizations. So it was a whole year, all their actions. And we found that almost a half the time they were working on transnational issues. So you can see in the red, domestically 52, transnational 39.3, and then Brexit was 2018, 2019. So Brexit was a continuing issue in the UK. And obviously that's really hard to label domestic or transnational. To give you an example, this was Campact in Germany campaigning against the Mercosur trade agreement. So that's with Latin American countries saying, save the Amazon. But here's the interesting catch. While all these four organizations that were in the study were campaigning often on a transnational issue, they were almost never targeting an international institutional actor. So what you can see here is in the black, there are three cases where they were targeting an international actor. The rest, 97% of the cases, are focused on a national government, like a minister or the prime minister or, or a local official. So what I try and draw out in the book is that while this network is transnationalized, while they have spread the same model 
in many different countries. They have a, a common underlying theory of how they affect change, which means that they're not trying to all campaign at the same time at the WTO or at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Rather, they try to mobilize citizens to put pressure on national decision makers. So again, think back to what we saw of the Polish protest in that first image. Polish people taking to the streets to put pressure on the Polish government or New Zealanders or Germans putting pressure on their own governments. And this is because part of the vision behind the model of this network was that even in a globalized world where issues spill over borders like refugee crises or climate change, you need to have power optimized for domestic influence because governments are still the ones that hold power. They're still the ones that signed the agreement that we saw yesterday at the UNFCCC. But that power needs to be networked for global scale. And just to give you an example of that, I think one of the most effective protests that follow this model are the global climate protests led uh, recently by Fridays for Future. But in the past, there were protests led by 350.org and some of the other organizations in my book. And these protests are built on that model, right? You're protesting around the world on the same day, on the same issue. You're enabled by digital technology. People anywhere in the world can sign up and log in with their own march, their own action. But you're mostly targeting your national decision maker. These aren't protests of people going to Sharm el-Sheikh to the climate summit. They're protests who are sitting in Canada, in India, in, you know, New Zealand and Burma in Uganda and saying, we want action on climate change and want you, the government of that respective country to take action. And this is just one example, which was back in 2014, well before the, the student climate strikes were, were happening, um, of how 350.org, with the support of, of the groups in this open network, um, organized uh, the People's Climate March in over 2,000 locations in 156 countries. So to conclude, what I hope I've sort of given you a bit of a taste for is that we need to study political organizations in the digital era, formal organizations with people, with staff. It's not just all algorithms and all happening online. And these organizations, the ones in my book that I study, are fascinating because they are able to harness and mobilize people rapidly because they are member-driven, rapid response, and multi-issue. Right, So they're mobilizing thousands and have access to millions often of members. And a second element of the book is just to tease out and to get us to think really carefully about what it means to be transnational today. That these groups, we've seen the spread of a model from you know the US to Israel to South Africa. And a whole chapter in the book looks at when and where this model works and it doesn't. And I should note, there is one group that starts in Italy and fails, and there are a bunch of failed cases we can talk about. And the groups campaign on transnational issues, but they do so by targeting national actors, right? So the nation state remains strong. And in a way, digitally distributed campaigns are a really good example of how digital technologies can enable people anywhere at any time, arguably, to, to harness collective power and use, use uh, digital technologies, but to, to make a real strong stance. I'm going to leave it at that. I've got much more to say, but I think it's time to hand over. Um, who wants to go first? I realize we didn't even figure that out. Yeah. Alicia, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to read the book. Uh, as you said, I I, I study. Uh, I, I'm not an uh, IR scholar. My perspective is more uh, of a scholar that studies uh, social movements and uh, civil society participation and political participation. That is, we can usually frame unconventional. That is to say, beyond voting, uh, all other forms of political participation through which citizens engage. Uh, with different kinds of uh, uh, contentious issues in societies and how they do so through digital media. So this is this book really resonates a lot uh, with what we study when we deal with social movements and civil society actors today. Uh, although I know uh, that this is a book that is uh, firmly positioned 
uh, as an intervention uh, in the literature on IAR, uh, as you also point out, uh, I think this also has the potential to say a lot to social movement scholars, uh, because it introduces really uh, an actor that is usually neglected in social movement studies. Uh, these digital advocacy organizations are not so much studied, are not so much taken into consideration, but we can learn a lot uh, from them, I think, also theoretically. Uh, when it comes to understanding what happens today uh, with political participation, grassroots movements, uh, and digital media. Because these are actors that actually, you know, engage in the same struggles uh, that uh, other types of actors, grassroots actors, active in societies, engage daily. Um, so really, it was... Uh, uh, casting light on a lot of issues that I tackled in the past years, uh, also relating to other contentious uh, uh, issues and relating to other forms of organizing. Um, given my background and the things that I investigate, uh, uh, there were some points in the book that for me were, you know, really uh, triggering some reflections that I wanted to share with you uh, and hear more about what is your opinion on them, given the type of investigation that you conducted? So the, the first uh, very interesting point that I find in the book is that um, we tend to uh, have claims today uh, when we think about civil society, social movements and digital media, that things uh, are much more horizontal when we think about uh, organizational structures and organizational patterns that uh, uh, basically uh, there has been an increased opportunity, increasing opportunities for engagement also on the side of individuals. There is a lot of literature in social movement studies that is saying that basically collective actors count much less than in the past today because of the internet, because of digital media, and more specifically because of social media platforms. Um, this literature is highly debated and contested because it really puts at the center the individual. What you do here uh, is uh, that you bring back the collective, uh, although in other forms through these digital uh, advocacy organizations, they are collective actors. They are not just uh, a bunch of individuals coming together and acting individually, also in a coordinated way. There are much more than that. You point out that, and I think this is really important. Uh, so they kind of go against uh, the so-called logic of connective action that some author speaks about uh, when they think about campaigns like or movements like, for instance, Occupy Wall Street, uh, the Arab Spring, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, it is very, very interesting that in a time in which digital media are so pervasive, what you show is that the collectivities are really important and that collective actors are really at the center stage once again. Uh, and that basically it is not true that we just can rely on individuals connected through the internet to carry out campaigns. Uh, in a sustainable manner and over time. Uh, yet, you have organization in which the individual participation is really important. So my question here for you is, uh, how, how do you recombine or how do they recombine uh, the individual level with the collective level? You gave us some examples for instance, through data analytics and so on, but really at a more kind of abstract level, there is this tension that civil society organizations have to face constantly. That is this recombination between the individual and the collective. How do we find this tension resolved if it is solved within, within this kind of organization? I think it is really fascinating. Uh, uh, and it is a tension that we can see uh, tackled here and there in the book as well. I, I would really like to hear more about that. Uh, another point uh, that is interesting, and it, again, it is related to the fact that uh, a lot of scholars are again saying, we do have the internet, so uh, campaigns spread virally, basically thanks to the social media platforms that become agents in themselves, uh, 
So once again, the collective actor is not that important anymore because uh, if you have the good message, uh, it can spread very quickly. And the message could, uh, could be crafted by one individual and then it spread virally and then other protests will occur in other countries, in other, co in other contexts and a social movement will be born and collective actors would not be so central. So this is really the current state of the art when we think about uh, uh, social movements uh, today. A lot of scholarship is really claiming this. Uh, once again, what we learn from your book is that actually the diffusion processes, the way in which from one organization, we got another one and then another one and then another one uh, went through what we might uh, call thick diffusion opposite to the thin diffusion that characterize uh, the diffusion across social media, through social media platform. This thick diffusion uh, put at the center brokers that are individuals that are able to travel across countries in order to speak about their organization, about their models, uh, to convince others to embrace that organizational model, to help them, to give them resources in some form also in the form of knowledge, for instance, to be shared. Uh, here is uh, a critical part, though, because these individuals uh, need to be able to travel, need to be able to have the resources to travel. Uh, so I think that here there is a tension, again, that I really would like to be discussed uh, about uh, the sustainability of this type of diffusion. Because it seems that, uh, to me, uh, this kind of diffusion is not for everybody, only for those who can afford that. Uh, so there are a lot of social movements and grassroots activists who basically do not have the material resources to travel and spread their organizational model, for instance, spread their knowledge, connect with others, and form transnational networks. So... Uh, when I was reading your book, I was really fascinated and impressed, but I was also thinking about the material inequalities that uh, characterize uh, today's global civil society, with this type of organization being seeming to be kind of the elite organizations that belong to the global civil society today. So what about the others? Uh, is this a model that can be replicated? Uh, or is it a model that really is deeply tied to some material aspects? So the very last question here uh, is related to uh, the fact that digital uh, advocacy organizations, they do not act in a void. They are always embedded in a broader network of civil society organizations and social movements uh, that uh, you know, organize across the world on several contentious issues. You mentioned climate, migrations, and other issues that are relevant today. You briefly mentioned the fact that they sometimes act with partners, but I am curious if you have any stories that you can tell us uh, more uh, to cast light on these uh, partnerships. Uh, I am curious, you know, in which way they interact with two other types of actors. On the one hand, the more traditional NGOs that you speak about also uh, in your book, like you mentioned Oxfam, for instance, there are others. If we think about climate change, we might think about Greenpeace and so on and so forth, uh, but also the more grassroots social movement organizations that are there uh, and that frequently are characterized by a constant engagement with uh, one specific issue, as you said. So here there is this tension between the multi-issue rapid response campaigns uh, and those uh, social movement organizations that for decades, they focus on a specific issue. And then what happens when the digital advocacy organization that comes from a transnational network comes at the domestic level and say, here I am with a lot of members. Now I will solve the issue of climate change. What happens with the interactions with those organizations, grassroots with less resources, but they constructed daily for decades, uh, you know, a solid political engagement around that issue. What is the result of these, uh, of these interaction? Because I imagine there might be a lot of tensions there. 
that are not discussed in the book. It's an entirely new project, probably, uh, that I really would like to see one day, you know, researched. Uh, but what happens? Do you have, you know, stories that you can tell us? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. Great questions. Um, I'll hand over to Mark before tackling them, though. All right. Thank you. Um, and I will time myself some on time. I love the book. You can see with all the nice uh, little flaggy posted things. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I will ramble in just a second. But I think I want to be honest. I love open. I think all the open members are net positive uh, and they play a role in the system. But I'm also humble because I spent seven years focusing on one issue. And you're right. We need that expertise, which you talk about uh, without these um, these uh, generalists uh, doing human rights work that they only come in perhaps when it's in the news and uh, in some in some activism place, they call it creaming. Um, it's sort of like Rhodes scholarship. If they only get the top people at Harvard or Yale or other institutions to apply and then they're like, look at us. So many Rhodes scholars are presidents or CEOs. Well, that's because you only started from the very top um, of of that group that you're able to take all this claim. And I think I think there's some tension with that piece. Um, my, my biggest takeaway is the tension is activity and outcome um, or correlation and causation. This is classic uh, tension that all of us struggle with. Um, and I think part of the digital advocacy organizations, some of the limitations I see is their tactics, the expertise and the coordination. So on the tactics, they started all with this email petitions. Petitions don't work anymore. It's just like faxing or, um, uh, whatever uh, other things that people uh, do at the at light end, uh, we they talk, and I know, and I know they're more sophisticated than just email petitions. They talk about the ladder of engagement. You start with a group of a hundred thousand people who will sign on to an email petition. Then some of them will actually call their policymaker or company or journalist. Then some of them might donate to an ad, um, a candidate, and some of them might turn up and go and lobby the actual policymaker. So it's not not that simple, but I. I worry that sometimes the analytics um, of look how many people clicked on open on this button that's now orange instead of blue and look how many people open this email, but did they actually get to the outcome? So they spent all this time looking at orange versus blue or follow us on Twitter or follow us on Instagram or whatever it is, but did it actually lead to the outcome? And that's my worries on the, on the expertise. Um, one of the great quotes you had was uh, from someone said, we lead from curiosity and openness rather than having all the answers. So there's lots of people in each of these countries that are paying for these organizations to advance these progressive social issues. And they basically are like, ooh, we just wake up every day, see what's in the news, we Google it, and then we go off and create a petition. And it, I love football and I'm loving the World Cup right now. And sort of the analogy to me is when you watch a bunch of six-year-olds play football, they all just chase the ball regardless of their positions. And occasionally they kick the ball in. And so they're like, Woo, look at us, we're great. But if you are paying someone, you actually want them to be good at defense if you're paying them to be defenders, you know, midfielders, uh, forwards. And I think part of the worry is that they, they are preventing or getting away with saying, oh, we're not experts. So we can't, we won't tell you what the answer is on climate change or bees or refugees. We're just really good at yellow versus blue on email <laughs> um, or getting someone to do that. And I think you sort of need that. They thought, uh, you talk in the book about the Calvary um, coming, like people need sort of the, the numbers. And I think different groups are partnering. You're right. I think there's some good examples, but I think more of it could be saying, we know how to do orange versus blue really well. How do we help you green peace before mm. COP so that we can get the most number of people to do that? And I think some of that happens. I don't know if enough of it happens. Um, and that's where the coordination piece, you talk about the transnational, and there's lots of examples of them saying like, hey, climate change is affecting all of us. How about we coordinate on this stuff? And they're like, yeah, no, the bees are really cool right now. Like, we'll do climate change later. And you're like, COP is happening, or the G20 or G7, is we know these, these uh, episodic events happen in advance. How much are the open organizations sort of leveraging these entities that they're all, or, and I think rightly so, organizing at the domestic level to fully leverage the before, during, and after of these global events. On, on Netflix, I also love Netflix, there's a great show that sadly stops called The Patriot Act uh, by Hassan Minaj, and he talked about like um, this tension between woke and lazy. And so there's all these people who want to be progressive and like, I care about climate change or LGBTQ or refugees, but all I'd rather do is just order another something else from Amazon. So if like, no matter how bad Amazon is, 
I, it's just so much better to order something and get it for free. And I worry sometimes with the woke versus lazy is they don't do the hard work that's sometimes needed to address these serious things. And so we've seen in the most recent past, it's other groups. It's like in the U.S., it's Indivisible that did these town hall meetings that required more than sitting in front of your computer or your phone and clicking. You actually have to go and engage your policymaker meet and demand the action. Or if we see uh, climate change, Greta Thunberg or young high schoolers, which you talked about, they did a great job of providing support, but people didn't go to these national groups. They created new groups. Um, and I think there's a there should be a reflection on some of these uh, digital advocacy organizations of what are we doing right? What are we not doing? Or what are we not doing enough? Or what are we doing wrong? That we need to do this. And that's part of the analytics. It's sometimes too tactical and perhaps should be do more to these post-mortem strategic things. Like I look at Russia, if you look at your, the map, all the dots, there's so many of these groups, open networks involved in Europe. We're all being hit hard and cost with inflation, energy, um, in Poland, you know, is uh, uh, not direct, but indirect victims of what's happening in Russia. How many open groups are coordinating on whatever uh, uh, progressive responses to the Russian uh, invasion? There's an example of a failed uh, attempt to organize if Trump went to war that didn't succeed, but we're actually dealing with a current. And I know the book came out before the, the uh, invasion of Russia, but I worry that where you have this um, successful network of progressive digital groups, they're sort of missing the ball on that. I have a few more uh, minutes and I'll just um, ramble. But one of the things I'm also curious is over time, there's all this new young, especially young talent that's coming from these organizations or coming from political groups. Is Greenpeace is hiring these mm. digital organizers. And I know you talk about Mob Lab that didn't work out well, but I think more and more of the legacy organizations, Amnesty, Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, whatever other names, they're getting, they're realizing they're missing the ball on Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, which I think is a limitation for a lot of these groups are not getting the younger groups. So I wonder if the ecosystem of the digital and the native or legacy organizations will converge whereby enough of the uh, awareness that digital organizing works for the legacy groups will make digital or advocacy organizations less valuable to the ecosystem. I don't know. I think there's um, there's something interest, but I think there's a value of the quick pivot, the, the quick fail uh, digital thing needing. I worry um, if you're trying to engage policymakers, they don't care about petitions. Again, they care about media, mass dem uh, demonstrations, voter turnout, and in the U.S. especially, is election funding. You mentioned in 38 Degrees is the third largest donor in politics. That's huge. Get up, um, yeah. get up sorry, in Australia. I don't think a lot of the other organizations, and maybe it's because they don't have enough money, maybe because the fortunately there's not that much money involved in politics like it is in maybe in Australia or the U.S., but I don't think they think about every day, how do we persuade, what matters to these policymakers? Is it petitions or is it something else? And I think media, I wonder how many of these networks, I know the coordinator, they get the word out sometimes with journalists, but I wonder if they meet with them, with journalists or outlets saying, how many people does it take to turn out or do a tweet campaign or whatever it is to sort of put more pressure on them? Um, okay, I think I just have one more minute. Um, I, one of the big questions I wonder with some of these groups is they're, they want to influence power, but not be at the table because they talk about the, you talk about the expertise being there. And I wonder if these advocacy groups had an opportunity to have, be at the table. So there's a classic phrase in American digital organizing. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, and so I wonder if these groups are just rather shout outside of a policymaker or whoever's in power than be in the room and say, hey, how do we figure this out? Like you're not doing enough on climate change or refugees or whatever it is. How do we get you there by not yelling or screaming, but putting on a suit and discussing with them? And I think, I, I wonder whether all of those groups would agree that they would like to a seat at the negotiating table. Fantastic questions. Um, I think I'm gonna tackle one of them, which you both came up with and then hand over so we have enough time. And that was the the combination of the football analogy. Are they all running after the same ball and how do they cooperate with social movement organizations? Because those two go together. In a way, the, the ways that digital advocacy organizations see their role is to be maybe the offense running after the ball and just trying to hit it in the goal, but they're reliant on other groups to do the work to do the defensive work in the football analogy or in the social movements advocacy space to bring up issues into people's uh, awareness. So to do awareness raising, 
to build support, to educate, you know, whether it be women's suffrage, telling, yeah, women should have the right to vote or climate change. Climate change is a big issue, right? But decades of people working on that in niche ways. And then obviously these groups can swoop in and take the claim, which was your point. Um, and there have been delicate moments, but there have also been moments of really effective collaboration, whether it be on refugee issues I've seen in New Zealand, where a specific campaign set up to increase the quota. It's one guy and he didn't have a big email list and then he could host his campaign and the, have access to the data, a bit like what you were saying, Mark. So I guess the the sort of point I would would highlight that is in the book and that I found most promising about the organizations, while I think there's definite limitations that you guys have teased out, um, is that if they work with NGOs that are issue specific, they have an advantage because they have this massive machinery mm. and they have masses of me uh, members, but they aren't good at organizing and they are driven by vanity metrics, which is this like, let's just get more members. I think they're totally valid critiques. I want to open up now to the audience. Um, we've got about 15, 20 minutes for Q&A, and hopefully I can respond to some more points also in that time. Let's get at least two or three questions. And if you're listening online, please type your question into the Q&A, and I will be, then be able to see it. And feel free to address questions to all of the panel. Maybe there are things that you were curious to hear from the others too. If you can introduce your name and then question, yeah. Okay, great. I'm Natalie. I'm from the States. Um, my question is around, there's a lot of new policy coming out in terms of tech privacy um, with, you know, pixels going away, uh, cookies, et cetera. I think a lot of other companies or corporations are able to pivot a little bit more because they have more touch points with consumers. It's not just around email clicks or certain things. Um, so anyway, all that to be said, how do you think some of the changing tech policy or limitations might affect these organizations and how are they going to have to pivot in order to be as successful and continue to reach as many you know people in their databases as possible thanks natalie let's have another question hi i'm dan i'm from the uk i was wondering um in the book it talks about um like what issues campaign on as a variable I was wondering as well if the message is a variable and whether these organizations are worried about, you know, if you take a more radical stance on a certain issue, it might alienate people from uh, participating on another campaign and whether identity formation has a role to play in this, like traditional organizations that focus on one campaign or one issue, they have members who are, have a certain identity relationship with the organization in a way that I'm not sure I wonder if different organizations of this model have different approaches to identity formation. In the UK, I've not seen people wearing 38 degrees t-shirts, but I have seen in Israel people wearing Zazim t-shirts. And so maybe there's mm. a difference there. Um, but yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Sophie. I'm a first year student here at SICE. And um, thank you all for sharing. This has been fascinating. Um, my question is about, there's a lot of, issue specific youth led organizations that have been especially power over the past powerful over the past five years and i'm curious if they fit into this typology so in my mind i'm specifically thinking about sunrise for example or march for our lives who i've worked a lot with in washington dc over the past four years um so i'm curious if those would be part of these transnational advocacy groups that you're thinking of because if so it's interesting how a lot of times they would play into some of your findings, but also from personal experience, ways that I can think that they actually don't. Like the example of um, whether or not they're at the table. In DC, a lot of these groups, they actually are at the table. They have lobbying collectives where they meet with you know staff on Capitol Hill, where they're going to White House meetings. So oftentimes they actually are at the table more than the general public might realize. Thank you. Great. Any other questions before we do a first round of responding? Yeah, great. Let's take another one. Actually, I'm John from the US. Um, 
I have a comment in the question. My comment has to do with the expertise issue. I'm a long-term move on supporter. And the reason I keep giving them modest amounts of money is I believe they're very sharp at, at winning elections or at least fighting elections. And then I'm actually uh, being more intelligent if I give them money rather than give a bit of money to the politician who's pushing my buttons at the moment. So it kind of blurs that distinction, I think. Their value to me is their expertise in this field. Um, and my question is, what's Steve Bannon up to? I mean, is there now a right wing version of this? Great questions. Um, well, I'll have a go at answering them. If you guys want to chip in at any point, feel free. I'll start, John. Great to have you in the audience. Um, and yeah, I would agree that they do have some expertise, but not on issues generally, but on digital campaigning. So that's kind of your argument, right? You know that they're good at using their money to get like really effective Facebook short videos out and to mobilize people, particularly move on in democratic primaries. You know, we should, those of you who aren't aware of this, move on held the first primary of all the democratic presidential candidates in the last election round like they were the ones who were hosting them so they have they have a really important you could argue function in uh within the democratic party too um but what about the right what about bannon so i do have a separate paper on this very question where i ask to what extent are right wing actors emulating this model um and i'm working on it with a german uh internet institute the weizenbaum because they know more about the right than me and essentially what we've done is we've found four examples of copycats. These are organizations that have explicitly said, wow, look at Move On. We need to create the right wing version of Move On. And actually a number emerged during the Iraq war period because that was when conservatives really felt under the pump from Move On. Um, in Germany, there's one group. In Australia, there's a group called Advance Australia, which is um, a more center right who are like, wow, Get Up is so powerful during election campaigns. They're fundraising all this money and did, tried to create the Australian one. Uh, and there's an international one called Citizen Go, which is um, modeled off Avaz um, and actually campaigns in a number of different languages, including Hungarian, I think Polish, Brazilian. So yes, there are examples. Steve Bannon's uh, attempted to do Le Mouvement, which was like influencing the European elections. But to my knowledge, he hasn't been involved in any of the organizations I just mentioned that are specifically trying to replicate this digital advocacy model of being multi-issue rapid response. Um, and what I would note, though, is most of the groups on the right don't tend to be member driven. So from what we can tell, it's a more a top down hierarchy and they're less doing the digital analytics that we see on the left. However, we, I mean, we haven't done the interviews. We haven't, you know, gone behind the scenes to talk to them. So we're, we're, we're relying on what's in the public space, but great question. Can I just add something in your yeah. book? One of the things I loved, you liked in your book, when you mentioned some of the right groups, the right directs their users versus the left tries to engage them. I thought that yeah. was an interesting distinction. And I think it's built on different ideas or norms, right? The left sees its power in people power and it's normatively wants to draw its power from people on the streets whereas the right is more comfortable just saying we've got some money this is what you should do you know and i should point out that there's other work like jen trades that actually suggests more top down like you were saying hierarchical forms of organizing are actually more effective online it's not the horizontal grassroots like people were arguing in the past it's actually divisions of labor and hierarchies and the right is better than that than the left and jen trady writes about that um, on the other questions, I'm happy to circle back. So Natalie, on tech privacy, yes, it was an issue for them when the GDPR reforms came through, it affected all of the groups, and they had to go and ask their members, will you continue to be members, right? Like, can we keep you on our database, essentially? So it was a very difficult pivot, and a number of them did lose a lot of members. Um, there are also very different rules in different countries. So Camp Act in Germany, for instance, has much tighter data pro uh, protections than in the UK. I've heard staffers of 38 degrees, you know, they can they can identify if your member gives a postal code, you know, at that postal code, you can buy commercial data that tells you, are they an alcoholic? How often do they buy cigarettes? You know, what kind of cheese do they buy with what kind of bread? So you can know a huge amount of people, uh, a huge amount about people that you couldn't in other groups. So, so it really does vary. But it is, a, I think, a really interesting question when we think about digital tech and governance. Um, on Daniel, on message, um, 
Yes, fair question. How, how much are they not just deciding on campaigns like refugees versus bees, but also on the content of their message, like how radical to be? Generally speaking, they they are catering for a more they see themselves as more mainstream middle because they they, they see other groups doing the hard if you want, like locking themselves to detention centers and stopping refugees from being um, put into a detention center, the kind of radical actions and tactics, they're less likely to ask their members to do, and they're less likely to appeal um, to that kind of uh, a rhetoric. Although I would say something um, that there have been internal debates within the group that if they're too moderate, maybe they're actually missing out. And talking about the ladder of progression, which um, Mark mentioned, the idea behind that is you get people in by first signing a petition and your message is, you know, just say how much you like the climate and then you ramp it up, right? Um, but actually sometimes some of the digital campaigners are arguing you should actually just go and say, ask your members if they're willing to be arrested outside the White House by locking themselves to a tree because they care about the climate. And actually some people will turn out for that that might not have even bothered with the email petition. And actually the radical messaging is maybe where you should start as an organization. So I don't think there's a one size fits all amongst the groups. And this comes to your second question about how do they identify as progressive and kind of beyond wearing the t-shirts or not, I think there's very big differences between the groups and even what it means to be progressive and where they see their role within the progressive community. So let's chat about that more of the aperitivo because, um, yeah, it's great to have your knowledge also of Zazim, 38 Degrees. And then Sophie, youth-led orgs. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. I So Fridays for Future and Sunrise started after I started this work. And it's an interesting question if I would have designed the research differently, if I had known in hindsight, because the research is, at the time I started, it was about the digital pioneers, which are now kind of old fashioned. They don't campaign on TikTok. They are, the average member is, you know, likely to be middle-aged like John, you know. It's not going to be, it's I'm so, like, it's a great, like my my parents are members, you know, my partner's parents are members, People, when I present this book in audiences to, you know, younger students have no idea who these organizations are and they're not looking at them. They're looking at other groups and partly because they're using different forms of digital communications, whether it be TikTok or Instagram. Um, so, and they may also uh, just be already organizing themselves, like the examples you gave of Sunrise. And Sunrise I see as being, using some of the thinking behind these models, like the digitally distributed campaigning, um, but not necessarily I wouldn't see within this example. It's not multi-issue. Sunrise is focused on climate, not necessarily using digital analytics to choose what to campaign on, but are savvy in many ways at using digitally distributed um, campaigning techniques. Um, and there are occasions where these groups do go and try and influence directly at the decision-making tables, but I, I for me, I think there's almost a next study that needs to happen on the next generation of digital pioneers. So maybe somebody, you know, in the audience wants to do that. We have time for a couple more questions. And then also if you, either of you want to make any other comments or responses. Hi, I'm Antonio Miami. I'm a visiting political scientist from McGill. Maybe this is sort of a outmoded question, but it seems to me in a lot of the literature, both in international relations and in social movements, part of the motivation of wanting to be involved in advocacy is to get somewhere, right? So that there's an outcome. You mentioned the mm. outcome, but in, in this sense, does transnational advocacy have a different definition of success than traditional social movements or traditional kinds of engagement in that kind of in that arena so I, i'm neither specialist in ir nor in social movements but i was wondering if there is a motivation that's different for people who engage through trend this kind of transnational advocacy in digital and we don't have any questions online so i think this will probably be the last one so then you have... hi um i'm alexandra i'm from the u.s uh so I wanted to ask, I know we've spoken about this maybe a bit, uh, but um, how do digital advocacy organizations interact with and compare to established 
more traditional political parties, since both entities mm -hmm. have certain agendas or are value driven in either a progressive way or less so. Of course, coming from the U.S., I'm, I'm thinking about, for instance, the Democratic Party and how it's a like one agenda uh, that it has as like the liberal political party in the U.S. Um, compares to more or to progressive DAOs and their agendas or values uh, that they're promulgating. And then uh, how do you see the relationship between DAOs and traditional political parties evolving over time if they in fact do interact um, and influence one another? And then I know you, you mentioned digital parties in your book. So uh, I was wondering if you could touch on that maybe in relation to this question. Thanks, Alexander. Do either of you want to throw in anything? Questions, comments? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I guess one. Go for it. One question I had. One of the things this bees refugees really shocked me. I thought it was a good um, tension. Is in the U.S. There's a thing called deep organizing, and it's been used a lot with LGBTQ. Is to say, I need to sort of find another to connect with you on a more human level. Let's a person who is L, who identifies as LGBTQ to try to persuade someone who may be not totally antithetical, but maybe on the fence to get them like to not um, to support their petition or whatever action it is. And I wonder, I wonder if uh, what your thoughts are on digital advocacy organizations using empathy because you talk about the Syrian the boy that yeah. really drove up like a change in in um, in various of these countries for the digital advocacy organization. But I wonder if they can do more on saying, you might not know what it's like to be Ukrainian, but here's some ways that, you know, you can empathize with them. So you mm. care. I, may I? Yeah, go for I, I want to add a reflection that is... Uh, uh related to some of the questions that have been raised on the role of members mm. because i was wondering how my, since they are reactive to their members and the issue they care about uh which is their role in the in setting the agenda more gen generally speaking because from where their members uh decide which is the issues that counts is it from the is it from the main from the mainstream media, the legacy, legacy mm. media? Is it from the debate on social media platforms? Are they also setting the agenda, or mm. are they, or are they, you know, simply listening to what the member says, but they are not taking an active role in shaping the agenda? Because mm. since we live in a world in which, uh, as we know, uh, political communication is deeply affected by propaganda, fake news, and so on and so forth. I'm wondering how much should I listen to their members if their members set the agenda through these other sources of information? Mm -hmm. This is a risk, right? So that was you know, something that I didn't think before, but in yeah. listening to you, I think it's a pressing issue for them or, or not, maybe not. No, and I think, I mean, a lot of these questions, I think, also relate to what we heard from Antonio about what is success for the groups and how do they see their role within the broader progressive side. So I'll tell a short anecdote to give you an example of how they understand their role vis-a-vis -vis their members and the broader progressive sector. Because when I was in Australia, Kangaroo Valley, I went to a session where one of the heads of uh, Camp Act, the German organization, was sitting there. We want to understand our impact better. So this exact point of activity versus outcome. You know, we're running around, we're doing a million petitions, but what are we actually changing? What is Camp? And I was new to these groups. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm happy to do an audit. I'm happy to go around and talk to you all and like find out how you understand impact. And this was when I was fresh, naive, didn't really understand what they did and what struck me. And I came up with these sort of four different, well, at least three solid different ways that they saw impact. The first was the vanity metrics was like membership growth, right? Getting as many members signed up and monitoring how growthy your petitions are. Like, oh my God, your petition's like viral in a day. This is amazing. And in fact, Felix, just last week when I presented to Camp Act again, came back to me and said, oh, can you tell me what the latest literature is on virality and petitions? How do I make them? You know, this is still a big issue, right? That's how they make their money. Bees are great. They get lots of funding. So that is an issue if that's all that you're doing. However, there is more than that. 
the groups also talked about wanting to win the campaigns that they run, right? Not just making money off them. Um, and then the question is like, how do they do that? And when do they do that? Um, and what their core model is mobilizing, it's not deep organizing. And for those of you who do my class next semester, transnational advocacy, we read Harry Hahn, who's great on this, this difference between mobilizing, which is broad, but thin versus organizing, which is deep. Um, and a lot of them want to like organize and develop the capacities of their members, but I would say they're not really good at that in general. They're good at getting people to turn out and like door knock, but not necessarily develop them beyond that. Um, and then changing political act outcomes is, of course, even if you are good at organizing, it doesn't even happen spontaneously. And that's where I think the political outcomes and shaping public debate happens when the, these groups, in my view, are working well with other progressive actors. So it comes back to them with the football analogy, being good at collaborating as a whole. They're not, they're not the only ones working on refugee issues or trade issues, but understanding their role within the broader ecology of advocacy actors. Um, and so coming back to your question about empathy, what I saw really effective in GetUp when it did this refugee campaigning was not just that it like started with the Ilan Kurdi moment, it was like, let's get everyone onto the streets. And then, oh, that moment's over, you know, the media, the legacy media are over it. Okay, let's go back to whatever issue is big in Australia. They kept campaigning because they'd set it as a strategic priority. So sometimes the groups do set long-term strategic priorities and they tried to shift their membership. And I spent a lot of time, Shen, the head of that campaign, was driving me to the airport as she was coordinating the campaign on the phone with others in the NGO sector. And she had the people who were like, you know, we want the vanilla strategy. We want to get, you know, the people who are a bit scared of refugees, but we want to get them on site. And then she had the people on the phone that were like, let's blockade the detention centers. Let's like stop the hospitals from handing over the babies to the state authorities. You know, they had all of them on the phone. They were coordinating across the sector and they were realizing and testing the messaging, which comes back to Daniel's point, that realize that they need to actually talk about refugees, not just from a place of empathy, but from actually these are people like us. So this is a big shift that happened in the refugee sector in Australia was saying refugees aren't these scary people that have been tortured and gone through all these political things. You know, they like football. They like music. They go to rock and roll concerts. You want them as your neighbor. So there was a big shift that happened partly from a, a political consultant. But yeah, so I guess and trying to tie that all together to this point is how do they define success? These groups themselves, because their money comes from their members, are often easily caught up in growthiness, caught up in vanity metrics. But their aim is to be more about political change and to build progressive political change. And Amandla Mobi in South Africa is fascinating because more of their funding comes from grants and grant bodies require you to trace your success. So you can start to see some really interesting differences. Um, Alexandra, political parties, I'm gonna be brief and then we can chat more at the aperitivo because I think this is a, this is a big question. Um, the political parties, uh, they campaign with these groups in very different ways. I'd say Move On is quite strongly linked with the Democrats. Get Up has worked a lot across the progressive uh, political party sectors, but say New Zealand and Germany, which have very different electoral systems, these groups don't necessarily have such strong institutional links with the political parties because of the way elections are run. Um, and in terms of whether, but I, what I think is probably the most interesting to kind of leave us on is that part of the purpose of the book is to understand the model that that um, empowers tactics like online petitions. It's not just to look at a particular activity like an online petition, but to understand why groups might want an, like to have somebody's email address and what you can then do with that. And I think there's some interesting work around political factions like Momentum in the UK. And I think Momentum in the UK, uh, you can uh, read James Dennis's work on this, where he looks at it as a movement faction um, or looking at, you know, five-star movement, which also does things like polling in order to understand and identify what its members want it to do. So I think there's some interesting practices that have diffused partly uh, in part across the social movement, digital advocacy organization, NGO and political party space. So there's diffusion happening, not just within one type of actor. And this is probably a broader point for all of you going into studying or thinking or acting that these definitions aren't so clear anymore. The distinctions between political party, between NGO, between, you know, 
um, think tank. And this is kind of part of the point of the book is to point to these actors that don't fit into those boxes so carefully um, and try to identify what it is that they do uh, a little bit more accurately. I think we should leave it there because there's an aperitivo waiting for us downstairs. Um, and I want to thank, first of all, uh, Mark and Alicia for fantastic comments. It was such a joy to be on this panel um, and for all the audience for your questions. Um, big round of applause, please. And yeah, please do join. Um, it's down in the bar, which is on the ground floor for those of you who don't know Julio's bar and there'll be uh, aperitivo. Thanks again.